Father, the Lord, the Lord. Let's just take a moment before we sing a song. Let's just take a moment to use our own words. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. We thank you, Abba. We thank you for your presence among us tonight. We honor you. We bow before you. We shall back you. We tell you how much you are great. There is none before you. Heaven is your soul and earth is your soul. We honor your presence among us tonight, for you are worthy. You are worthy to be exalted. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy. Now is the time where the Father seeketh true worshipers to worship in spirit and in truth. Hallelujah. Yeah. And before we sing another song, we express the, our heart before you. We express our hearts before you. Out of the heart is the issues of this life. We are grateful for your presence. We are grateful for your anointing. We are grateful for who you are. You are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Gibor. We honor your great name. We honor your great name, Jesus. For at the mention of your name Jesus for at the mention of your name there must be a shifting there must be a shaking at the mention of your name come on we are worshiping the father in spirit and in truth we worship you we worship you we worship you hallelujah hallelujah yeah, be exalted, be exalted, the Lord Jesus. Before we sing another song, we ask, we ask, we ask you, Lord, to accept our worship, accept our evening sacrifice unto you. As we open up our mouths, accept our worship. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory be unto your name, glory be unto your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. We exalt your name. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to sing this song together as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Glory. We give you thanks, God. We give you thanks. Anybody want the presence of the Lord to be among us tonight? Hallelujah. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare nor our living before. We sing the presence, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone oh your presence Lord and we should know the chorus let's sing it in our rooms say holy spirit you are welcome of love this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord There's nothing worth more that can never come close. Nothing can compare your our living home. Oh, we sing your presence, Lord. Oh, 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 oh see, we have tasted and seen. Of the stupid best of love, where our heart becomes free as God and our shame is unknown. Yeah, your presence, Lord. 
And with our hands we turn, we cry, we sing tonight, sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Oh, flood this place, God, and fill the atmosphere for your glory. God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. We walk beneath your presence, Lord. Your presence, let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let's sing this part. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Jesus. 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 Jesus, there's just something that I'm on the case I am about your name, you're the master and our savior, we call you Jesus, like a fragrance, yes, Lord, after, after the rain, oh, for kings and kingdoms, they shall all, they shall all pass away. But there's just something, my God, my God. One more time. There's just something about your name. There's just something. There's just something about your name. Hallelujah. There's just something. Praise the Lord. I am Andrew Lins, and I am privileged and honored to be serving the universities and colleges apostolic ministry as president for the academic year 2021 to 2022. I know that we're living in challenging times. We're living in unprecedented times, times that we have never seen before. And we're all trying to navigate through the change and shift of education system and also navigate through this global pandemic. It is hard, but I can recall the early church in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials and tribulations, they thrived. The church grew and the word of God multiplied. And I believe that today we can thrive as a campus ministry in the current situation. There is still a great opportunity for us to reach the uttermost. Speaking of uttermost, this academic year, we will be moving forward under the theme to the uttermost. Jesus said to his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Your uttermost might be different from my uttermost. Your uttermost might be in that classroom, it may be on the campus, it may be in that virtual space, it may be at work, it may be in your community, or even in your home. The mandate still remains, we must reach the uttermost. So wherever you are, whether you are from zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, or even if you're just coming into this new camp ministry, we are going to reach the uttermost, even though the methods might change, the gospel remains the same and their hearts are desperate and in waiting for someone to bring them this great message of salvation. So help me, help your brother, help your sister as we move forward in bringing the gospel to the uttermost. God bless you all. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Welcome, welcome, welcome one and all to our first UCAM national event. And we're starting, hallelujah, with the word of God tonight. Hopefully you can all hear me. Hopefully you can all see me. I know the lighting is not that perfect, but to God be the glory, we have the light within us. And so tonight we can rejoice because of that. I want to welcome each and every one that is here. And in just our roll call way of doing greetings and welcome, if you can just for a minute, just shout a praise, um, type your campus in the chat, um, type which church you're joining from, wherever you're joining from. And let's just really and truly welcome each and every one to universities and colleges apostolic ministry as you would have probably seen in that video i am the national coordinator and it is a privilege for me to be in this position tonight so feel free tonight to, to type in the chat let us know where you're tuning in from let us know which campus you're tuning in from let us know which church you're tuning in from and let us just even if you're not a part of a church just tell us which parish which country you're tuning in from as we are really really glad to be here tonight i am really excited and you know as the video just shared we are excited to be going forward in reaching the uttermost with the gospel i know that we're in a pandemic um, as you comers we're not so used to always being on a zoom platform we're used to going to the different places going to the different communities joining with a campus and uh, but times have demanded that we meet on this platform and we believe that the gospel even though the times have changed and the platform has changed it is still powerful and it is still it's Effective. It can still reach many, hallelujah. And so we are happy tonight to be embarking, hallelujah, on this journey, not just a campus by itself, but together as a ministry. And I believe it is important for us to be taught together, for us to fellowship together. As the scripture uh, is it, written in Acts chapter 2, it says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and fasting in prayer. Hallelujah. And we want to continue in that same thing that started on the day of Pentecost. And I'm excited about this journey that we are about to go on because as we know, and especially those that are here from Jamaica, our country needs Jesus. And I believe we are in the time where we are youth and we're exuberant and therefore with all this energy that we have within us we're going to translate that into bringing the gospel of jesus christ to the uttermost so once more i welcome you all welcome all the zones welcome everyone i welcome you all in the name of jesus christ and at this time we're going to be going into the UCAM teaching sessions and to introduce our speaker for tonight will be our national Assistant President for Events and Planning, which is Brother Jetha McLean. In Jesus' name, go ahead, Jetha. Bless the Lord, everybody. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have the distinct privilege to introduce an anointed man of God and an humble servant who is called to do the work of the Lord. He's a licensed minister in the UPCI, and he's married to one Lindsay Cressman, and they're expecting a wonderful baby in a few months. And I must say that is a miracle in itself. He serves as a, a lecturer at the Urshan College, and he has an enormous passion for teaching students about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And likewise, he is passionate about the changing of lives through Jesus Christ. I want you all to please help me make welcome Brother Colin Cressman, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Hope everybody can hear me well, uh, can see me well. Uh, and uh, I'm just excited to be here uh, and wish that I could be in person. Wish that uh, all of, you know, as was always already said, you have this pandemic stuff going on and I wish that we could all just be uh, actually uh, together. Uh, I am full of love. I love hugging people. So that's the number one thing for me about the pandemic is we're supposed to be fellowshipping. I wish that every brother and sister that I was able to see welcome them in the Lord and be able to wrap them up, show them the love of Christ. Uh, so I'm 
uh, sad that this is over a Zoom call, but I am also very excited that I am all the way in Missouri uh, and we are able to share the gospel, brothers and sisters, and be uh, anywhere in the world. So I, I think, you know, I get excited to think about what what would the Apostle Paul do uh, if he had our technology? You know, we think about persecutions and, and things that, that they faced and, and problems that they faced in the early church. But you think about the advantage that we have. We not only have the same spirit that the apostles experienced and had, but we also have technology that we can reach across this entire globe. So I want to start out there just to encourage all of you. You have so much just at your fingertips that uh, we, we have the spirit and we also have the ability, the physical ability to do things uh, that the, the past in history, they, they weren't able to do. Uh, and so the, the field is ready uh, and I'm excited for all of you that are working in colleges and I'm going to jump right in and I just want to share with you uh, some, some uh, practical uh, uh, information on, on how to approach uh, just ministry in general. And I want to talk about what the mission of the church is. And uh, sometimes it's, it's funny to even talk about the mission of the church. Uh, so I, I will, uh, in a little bit, share my screen. We'll go through some scriptures so that you can see the, the scriptures as I go through them. Uh, but right now, I'll just tell you whenever you need to write something down. Uh, and and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, first thing you need to know about the mission of the church is that we don't actually have a mission. Okay? So you think of, of the church as, as okay, well, what is, what is the church's uh, objective? What is the church's mission? And so the first thing you need to write down is that the church doesn't have a mission, but God has a church for his mission. Okay? It's not that we have uh, a mission. It's not that we have a task as part of the church. That would actually require human means. That would require uh, our ability to, to figure out the next step. It's not actually a task that is given to us, but actually the redemption of the world is something that the Lord desires. And we are his tool to accomplish that task. It's not that the church has a mission, but that God has a church for his mission. We are his tool. So I'll say that again so you can put it in your notes. But God has a church for his mission. And we are his chosen, chosen method to redeem the world. And so the first thing I want to jump to is a very interesting and familiar story uh, is uh, the, the story of uh, Abraham. And let me see here. If I can be tech savvy and share my screen with you. If not, you can grab your Bibles because that's all I'll be looking through. Let's see what we can do here. This may be me. I'm, I'm technologically challenged. Well, I don't want to take up time trying to figure this out. Wait, here we go. Um, we are going to... Uh, jump here. There we go. I figured it out. The Lord is helping me. Everybody able to see that? Okay, so I'm looking here at Genesis chapter 12. And this is a story of Abraham. And in the story of Abraham, uh, you have this very interesting dynamic, something very odd that's going on. I want you to think about if you were Abraham, and this is even before his name is changed to Abraham, that uh, he is not a Christian. He's not even uh, a Jew at this time. Okay? He's, he's not even uh, part of what you could call the people of God. He's just listening you know so think about how weird he might have been <laughs> you know can you imagine walking through life and then you hear a voice and you say i'm gonna follow that voice you know who who else is following it who who else is going to be uh uh, uh that you can compare notes with okay so he is 
somebody in a pagan society. They have multiple gods. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Abram decides that he's going to follow this voice that he's hearing. He starts following God. So first off, that is exciting for me because that means God is going to always be talking to somebody. Even when nobody else around you, nobody else is going on, he's going to start calling people. He's going to start doing things. But he says, so this is chapter 12. Now, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And what, what an incredible step of faith. He says, I want you to leave everything that you know. And he doesn't tell him the plan. He doesn't say you're going to go to uh, such and such place. You're going to go to this or that place. He doesn't tell him the full plan. He just says, you're going to go to a land that I will show you. So just to respond to God in the first place, he's, he's stepping out in faith. I'm going to go to a place that the Lord's going to show me. He says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so what I want to talk about here for a moment is uh, what it means uh, to be blessed. Now that can be uh, an aspiration when we read about blessing. Sometimes we can think, well, you know, uh, especially in the pandemic right now or in, in all of the things of, of, of trying to, to get back to normal. We want things to be back to normal. And we think, well, Lord, we would really like for you to bless our homes, bless our, our uh, work situations, bless our ministries. But blessing is connected here. So in, in the Hebrew language, blessing here is connected with inheritance. So when God tells Abraham that he is going to bless, when he says he's going to bless Abraham, he's saying he's going to give him an inheritance. Now that inheritance means that he has a responsibility because he says at the very end of it, he says all the families of the earth will be blessed through him. Okay, so this is not... Uh, to, to try to make this as packaged up so we can move on to the next point. But this is not just, Lord, let me have a good life. Lord, I, I want to follow you like Abraham, and I want to have faith like Abraham, and I want to, to be blessed like Abraham. To be blessed like Abraham is to be loaded down with an inheritance that is for the world. You're supposed to serve the entire world. So this is where I tell college students when I teach is all of the good things that I can have in life, any kind of, of uh, extra benefit, stuff like that. The Lord can hold it all back from me because I'll have a good life in heaven. I will be blessed. I will be happy. I will be taken care of when I get to heaven. But that means right now, my task on earth is to share the inheritance I have. And so what I want to tell you right now is your inheritance is the spirit. And we're going to, I'm going to give that to you for notes so that you understand where we're going. We're going to jump to uh, Galatians in just a moment. But your inheritance, where you are, no matter what your field, uh, no matter what context you're ministering in, uh, what school campus you're on, what church you're part of, you have an inheritance all the way from Abraham. And that is you are filled with the spirit. When you read scripture, you have an experience. You have the voice of God dwelling inside of you, and you walk by faith as an inheritance for the entire world. Your job, who we are as the church, our number one job is to make sure that we are living for other people because our souls are already taken care of. I have already been called out. I have already been transformed. My life has already been changed. And it's because of the spirit. So this is where you see the very beginning of God's mission. Okay, so God has a church for his mission. And what is his mission? To bless the entire world. To bless all the families of the earth. That's his mission. He is going to redeem us. So now uh, I want to jump to uh, Galatians in a moment. I want to kind of set it up. So we are 
uh, 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 you, you can tell even just by the prayer we had and the, and the worship that we had at the beginning of this call, we are blessed to have uh, spiritual, supernatural experiences in our life. Okay? I uh, could, could go through this Zoom call and probably ask all of you to give a testimony real fast of, of something supernatural that has happened in your life. And we could all go one at a time. And even if you haven't experienced something that maybe you would classify as a miracle, I can tell you the number one miracle in my life is that I spoke in an unknown language. And that is, is fulfillment of the word of God. And that is something you should understand about who we are. We are apostolics. Uh, and and uh, what that means, just in a nutshell, is that when I read the Bible, I want to live what the Bible says. Now, some Christians don't do that. You would be surprised at how many Christians around the world have missed out on things that God could do in their life simply because they don't live what they read in scripture. So you think of, for example, uh, uh, a person who, who says that they're a Christian, but they say that speaking in tongues is not of God or that being filled with the spirit is not uh, something that the church is supposed to do today. They're missing out on such a wonderful blessing. And the reason that we experience that is simply because we picked up our Bibles and we read what happened in the Bible and we said, okay, God, let's let it happen. And so I want to take a little bit of time. I want to give you a little bit of history. So you have a man by the name of Charles Parham in 1901 and Charles Parham is the uh, what scholars call the the father of the modern Pentecostal movement but Charles Parham he had a bible college and so I'm, I'm telling you this story not just for historical context but also to encourage you you all teach you're all ministers you are a light to whatever campus that you're on Charles Parham was working at a college and he got together with all of his students one day and he said, let's find out what happened in the Bible when people got saved. What was the experience that they had? Now, that is seems very simple. But at that time in history, it, it wasn't done. Christianity had become so broken and everybody needed a revival. And the way that the revival started is they picked up their Bibles and they said, let's read the Bible and let's see what experiences they had in the Bible. And Charles Barham, when he asked his students, he said, how did they uh, receive the spirit? What was the sign of being filled with the spirit? And all of his students got together and they read through Acts and they said, they all spoke in tongues. And so then, okay, so you're talking about a group of people who don't even know what tongues are. They're trying to figure out, you know, you think about Abraham. Abraham's listening to a voice that he has no idea where it's coming from and saying, get out of your country. Then you've got this Pentecostal movement in a college going on. And this guy says, well, we don't know what it's going to be like, but they all spoke in, in different languages. They spoke in tongues. None of us here know what that's like, but let's, let's just pray and talk to the Lord about it. And they started having a prayer meeting and a woman by the name of Agnes Osman started speaking in Chinese for three days straight, okay? So that was, they, they read it in the Bible. This is, this is the pattern. They read it in the Bible, and then they said, okay, God, we're going to live what we read. We're going to live it out. We might not have all the answers. We may not have all of the, the different pieces perfectly put together, but I've read scripture, and now I'm going to take the challenge to live scripture. Okay. And so I like to say as, as Pentecostals, we live right off the page. You know, it's not like a, it's not like a good uh, story. It's not some kind of uh, bedtime story, things like that, where you're reading it and it gives you the feel good and, and different things like that. No, when I read it, something in the Bible, I get to read it and I get to say, okay, God, bring that to life in our world right now. And it happens. And that's what happened with Charles Parham. And that started the Pentecostal movement, and William Seymour was a student of Charles Parham, and William Seymour kicked off the Azusa Street Revival in California, and it completely changed the world, okay, 
And so all of us, when we have that experience, whenever we speak in tongues, that should be your number one confirmation, should be your number one hope in life, that God is real and that God has a call on your life. He has an inheritance for you to share with the world. Is he has called you out. If you have that experience, you are equipped with everything you need to go and to minister on your campus, wherever you are, and you get to share that with other people. Okay? So now I want to encourage you even further. We're going to go to uh, Galatians, and I want to show you uh, some opposition that Paul received uh, from, from the, the early uh, Jews that Paul was fighting against, and something so cool that he does with, with how we are supposed to be Christians, what the church actually does within this world. So let's get back here to our, our, our scripture. We're going to go to Galatians. And we're just going to start here at the beginning. I'm going to scroll through. So if you have your Bibles, you can, you can look through with me. But you have, he, he has in this very first part, a very typical greeting. He says that he's an apostle. Uh, but what's very interesting about Galatians is usually Paul, whenever he writes a letter, he says nice things about the church that he's writing to. He gives them, you know, he says, I thank God for you all. That's something that Paul usually does in his letters. In Galatians, he doesn't. He's not happy with the Galatian church. He doesn't thank God for him. So he just gets right down to business. He says, I'm an apostle. He says, I'm an apostle from Jesus Christ. I wasn't made an apostle by any human. I wasn't made an apostle by any man, but I was an apostle by Jesus Christ. And so I want you to write that in your notes. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about where you are and yourself as a minister is who has called you to be a minister. Is it any human? Is it any kind of, of man-made idea or, or church? Actually, if you've spoken in tongues, if you have received the spirit of God, God has supernaturally put his calling on your life. And you could say this just like Paul. I wasn't called by any man. I wasn't called by any human. But I have an experience that the Lord dwells in me. And that makes me a minister. Okay. So he elaborates on this a little bit more, but he does a greeting. And then he gives his testimony of how the Lord uh, called him out. He's on the, so you know, from the, the book of Acts, he's on his way to persecute Christians and the Lord hits him up and, and, and changes his life. And then he goes and he studies the word and he gets ready to, to uh, uh, minister to everybody. But where he's getting upset with all of these is there were some Jews that were coming behind. So Paul would go and he would minister in a city or a place and, and Jews would come up after him and say, no, you're not actually saved because you need to do some physical things. Okay, I want you to write that in your notes, physical things. You need to do some physical things in order to be saved. Okay, so Paul is writing to Galatians and saying, seriously, are you so uh, uh, shallow? Are you so uh, uh, simple minded? Are you uh, so dumb? You know, he, he has some pretty strong language here. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? <laughs> you know, he's, he's upset with them. He's saying, why are you believing this? And so I want to jump to... Uh, chapter three, and this is where I'm going to start kind of walking piece by piece, and, and we'll read some passages together, uh, and I want to, to show us what it means to be people, ministers of the spirit, instead of ministers of what Paul says is the flesh, a minister of the flesh, that we should be walking in the spirit, not in our flesh, and so uh, he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Okay, before our very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Okay, or before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed. He's, he's telling him, he's like, why are you even, uh, uh, why, are you, why are you getting distracted? In verse three, he says, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So this is where 
he's given this picture of the Christians and the Jews is you have an experience. Okay, you are filled with the spirit. You are are you have that that supernatural experience that you spoke in an unknown language. And he's asking, why are you trying to do physical things? Why are, why are you in trying, trying to do physical things that these Jews are pushing on you? Okay. And then he jumps and he says that it's all going to be a curse. And then the purpose of the law. So this is the Old Testament. And this is where, why I started with Abraham. I want you to have this in your head of Abraham is part of the law. It says, what purpose then does the law serve? This is verse 19, chapter 3, verse 19. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so I want you to, to adopt that for yourself. Everybody say, I am a son or I am a daughter of God. Okay, through faith in Jesus Christ, and Paul's talking here to the church, and, and he'll talk about this later. When he uses the language of sons, he's talking about adoption. That we are all sons and daughters of Jesus Christ through the Spirit. And it was this promise that was given to the seed. Okay, so Abraham was promised that his seed would bless all of the earth, that all of the earth would be redeemed through his seed. But then you have all of this time until Jesus Christ. So verse 27 says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Okay. If you are Christ's. Okay. So you can look yourself in the mirror, maybe look at the, the video camera and, and see yourself and say, are you Christ's? Are you his? If so, then you are Abraham's seed. So that promise that was made to Abraham, that he was going to be a blessing to the entire world, that his, his purpose, his, his invitation into God's mission was that he was going to bless the entire world. It says that we are heirs of that promise. And then you get to chapter four. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. Okay. Uh, this excites me so much. Uh, and I just want to give you some notes to, to Mark so, to teach Bible studies and to testify to people. In verse six, chapter four, verse six, when it says, cry out, Abba, Father. In the Greek language, uh, cry out is the word kradzo. And that word, Paul actually uses it. Scholars have, have made this argument. Multiple people studying scripture, they look at that word kradzo and how Paul uses it. And when he says cry out, it means in an unknown language. Okay. That's, that is so exciting. Okay. It's not just a, a, a fun story that we're reading saying, oh yeah, I'm a child of God. I'm a, I'm a son of God because I believe in Christ. No, 
you can know with confidence that you are a minister, an heir of the promise. You are, are his because you have spoken in tongues, crying out, Abba, Father, to cry out, Abba, Father, to call him Father, to be his child is actually to speak in an unknown language that cry out. This is just so exciting to me. Sorry. Uh, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those who by nature are not gods. Okay, so this is where he's going into uh, back against the Jews. And so I want to skip down here to where he starts talking about uh, Abraham again. And this is in verse 21, chapter 4, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Those are our physical things. The law had physical requirements. And then the spirit came and, and filled us. And now we're guided by his spirit. And we obey scripture, empowered by his spirit. But he says, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, that one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in the and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. Okay. So he says in verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now. I uh, I, I want to unpack this. Uh, what he's doing here with the sons of Abraham. And this is what I want to talk to you about your purpose in life and, and why you can trust and be encouraged anywhere you go as a minister. Okay. Paul has just made the argument that you are adopted, that you are a child of God. You are part of that inheritance. When you have that spiritual experience, okay, you have, spoke in an unknown language and that means that you are his okay then he starts combating people okay he says there's two sons there's one that is of the bondwoman that paul says later he says is of the flesh and there's one son that was born of the spirit of promise now what's weird is the way that paul twists this story okay so I want you to, to work here. So if I was with you in person, I would be asking you questions and making you give me answers. And, and I would try to get everybody to be thinking. So I need you to do that on your own is, is work, work through this in your, in your mind. The Jews, who is their father? Who, who are they descendants of? But they would be descendants. Technically speaking, they would be the descendants of Isaac. Okay? that they they follow, you know, so you have all of the Jews and the Israelites saying, we are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? So they actually, their, their physical lineage, okay, so notice I use that word, their physical lineage is from Isaac. But Paul here says that they are actually the sons of, of Hagar. They are descendants of Ishmael. Why? What? How can he say that? What, what in the world is he doing? How, how come he, Paul can say that? And I want to tell you, this is why. Think of Abraham and think of why he had Ishmael. Why did Abraham, the man who has a promise on his life, who has a call on his life, what happened with Abraham? is he started working things from his own point of view and his own limitations and his own fears, okay, that he had to take matters into his own hands. Say, well, God, if something's gonna, if, if I'm going to bless the entire world, I have to have a son. So I got to take matters into my own hands and I got to do things on my own. And so that's why Hagar is, is the, the woman of the flesh is that was not the promise of God. That was not what God intended. God put Abraham in an impossible situation. Okay? 
He has an old man with an old woman that are beyond childbearing age. He puts them in an impossible position so that he can do a supernatural work in their life. And Abraham doubts that supernatural work of God and has a child by his own means. And here Paul is saying, all of these Jews, all of these people that are trying to put limitations and burdens on us, they are children of the bondwoman because they're trying to achieve salvation by their own means. They are trying to achieve the promise of God by their own physical abilities. But we are the descendants of Abraham, the children of promise. We, okay, so I'm a Gentile. You know, if you're going with biblical language, I'm a Gentile. I'm not Jewish. But Paul just called me a son of Isaac. Paul just put me in the lineage of that, that first promise. Why? Because I have cried out to the Lord in an unknown language, and he is my father. And the reason I can say that is because Paul is saying, it's, if you're a child of the flesh, then that means you try to achieve things by your own means. But when you do and you experience supernatural things, you're a child of the spirit. I want to use this. I want to encourage you. Go read Galatians chapter 5 and, and 6 and, and, and go do it when we, when we finish here tonight and, and throughout this next week. Read Galatians a lot and, and, and be encouraged by what Paul is saying is we have this decision. We have this ability. Do we want to be? A minister, do we want to be working in the world as somebody of the flesh that's just trying to do things by our own abilities? Or do we want to be somebody that trusts in the supernatural ability of God? That I can look at all the pieces and, and like Abraham, I can say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm not physically able to do certain things. I've got physical limitations. And so I have temptation. I'm, I might even be tempted to sin because I have a desperation to do things by my own power. But if I can be a son or daughter of the spirit, then supernatural things take place. And any time that you are feeling doubt, any time that you are feeling like you are not called to be a minister, any time that you are wondering where the, the outpouring of the spirit is on your campus, remember that you spoke in tongues. Remember that you are a child of the spirit which means that supernatural things will take place. We don't have to worry so much. We want to be organized. We want to do things as best we can. But do you realize that we don't have to, to worry too much about if we have the best products, the best strategies, the best uh, uh, kind of presentation, if we've got the, just the perfect answer. But do you know that every time that you go and you talk to somebody and any time that you are present on that campus, there is a, a presence around you, that there is the spiritual, the real presence of God that is around you, that all you have to do is open your mouth. All you have to do is start proclaiming the name of Jesus and be there. And it's not about my own skill. It's not about your own skill. It's not about if you have the, the best uh, ability to preach or to teach Bible studies, which we'll talk about uh, next time we're together. It's, it's that we are empowered by the Spirit. We get to live right off of the page. And so that is the church. I said at the beginning, God has a church for his mission. His mission is to be a blessing, to redeem all of the families of the earth. That's his mission. And he has a church you and me, he has a church that has an undeniable experience and miracles, signs, and wonders follow us. We demonstrate the reality of God. We demonstrate the real presence of God, not by our own means, but we do it because we're willing to be vessels. We're, we're just here. The Lord gets to work through us. And it's such a... Uh, a such an encouragement to me. And I, I want to share this, this final moment with you. And then I want to give time for questions, but I want to first uh, 
share a testimony with you, and then uh, pray a blessing over all of your ministries. But my wife and I, uh, as was mentioned earlier, my wife and I are having a baby. We're having a, a baby girl in March. Is our, our first child. And we actually were not allowed, uh, medically speaking, we weren't supposed to have a baby. We've actually been trying to have a baby for a few years. And so Abraham's story means a whole lot to me. <laughs> uh, I understand what it feels like to, to go into the doctor's office and the doctor actually give you medical reports that say we have absolutely no idea why you and your wife can't have a baby. There was no answer. And so we pray. And it was prophesied over us that we were going to have a baby. And this is what I want to share with you because I don't believe that it's just for me. Anytime that I get to testify to somebody, I want you to experience, I hope more than anything that you feel my faith. And I believe that God can, can translate that faith even through a Zoom call. Is it was prophesied that we would have a baby and that when we had that baby, it would be the first of many miracles and the start of a revival. Now, I'm sharing that with you because I don't believe that the blessings and the miracles and the works of God are for just one individual, one place, one area, things like that. But I'm having a baby. When the doctor said that things weren't supposed to happen, that supernaturally, God is able to do things. Now, that just encourages me. I already had faith in God. I already knew he could do supernatural things. But I have even more testimony now that God is ready to have revival across the world. And he's able to do things. And I don't believe that it's just a revival for me here in Missouri. But I believe that all over your country right now, that God wants to pour out his spirit. And it's going to be with testimonies just like mine that you're going to see miracles happen on those campuses that you minister in. You're going to see supernatural things happen in your churches. And it's going to be because we've, we've thrown up our hands and we say, God, all we have is your word. And we're just going to rely on your spirit. We're just going to rely on your supernatural ability. We're your tools. We are the church that you have for your mission. And so use us. We are, are your vessels. We just want to be used. I believe that. I want to pray for you all right now, and then I want to, to give some time for, for uh, questions, but I want to pray. I, I feel God right now so strongly. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you right now for all of my brothers and sisters that are on this call. Jesus, no matter our needs, no matter our, our uh, comfort or discomfort, no matter our situations, and no matter our burdens, Lord, we know that all good things come from you. They all come from above. And so, Jesus, right now, we take note of all those good things, that they would build our faith, that they would stir us up, and that we would remember those testimonies so that we can be ministers for you. And so, Jesus, right now, with those testimonies in mind, I call your name down. Jesus, I call your blessings down on your people right now where they are. Jesus, that you would empower them. Lord, that your spirit would be alive and working through them in a way that they've never experienced in the past. But God, that when they walk on those campuses, when they walk around those places, when they, when they drive up, when they walk up, when they, when they arrive, Jesus, let them feel your faith. Jesus, let there be a burden on them that they know that you have people, souls in those places, and you have equipped them. Jesus, they are ministers of your spirit, that they are not here limited by their own abilities, but Jesus, they are empowered by your spirit.
Don't ever let the enemy, don't ever let the deceiver, Jesus, we rebuke the devourer. We rebuke the deceiver, Jesus, that he would have nothing that he could say to any of us that would distract us, that would deter us, that we would always remember, God, I am filled with your spirit. And if I ever doubt, I will find a prayer room, Jesus. Let them all find a prayer room where they pray until you speak through them once again. Let them pray until they hear those tongues and know that they are yours until they know once again Jesus that they belong to you that they are your son that they are your daughter and let them feel the strength to go minister again Jesus we claim healing we claim miracles we claim an outpouring of your spirit Jesus everywhere that they go let them be ministers empowered for your mission God to redeem every human they come in contact with we thank you Jesus we thank you, Jesus. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Oh, he's good. Jesus is good. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh. I am so uh, blessed to, to be part of this call with you all tonight. This has been uh, so encouraging. Uh, I thank God for all of you. I, th I thank God for all of you. This is such a, uh, an encouragement. I want to give a little bit of time uh, and, and uh, just, just a few minutes, maybe, uh, if, if you have any questions or things that you wanted clarified of, of stuff that I talked about, uh, you can put it in the comments or, or if you want to unmute yourself, you can, you can uh, let me hear the question. But I want to give give some time to to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, is it uh, Andrew? Yes, I'm just yes. gonna go ahead and break the ice. Uh, yep. First of all, that was a, a great start to the teaching tonight, um, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, what would you say, because we know on the day of Pentecost that um, there were 120 in the upper room and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and the church started. But you mentioned Abraham and many times our calling doesn't start like where there's a crowd of 120. Sometimes it's, all, sometimes it's just like an Abraham thing. And what would you say to an Abraham um, <laughs> in our generation where there's probably not a lot on our campus? <laughs> Or there's not 120 on the, in that campus, minister on yeah. in that campus. What would you say to that Abraham when they hear that call and it seems like oh, this is ridiculous? I don't want to do it. How do you how would you encourage that Abraham? Yes. Well, the nice thing is we are following Abraham, but we've got some secret sauce that Abraham didn't have. Is even when you're alone, you're not alone. The spirit of God is with you. Now, the cool thing is if you look in the book of Hebrews, it says at the very beginning of Hebrews that uh, in the past, okay, so they're referring to the Old Testament. They say in the past, we heard from the, the prophets. Okay, That's how we heard from the Lord. But now we hear through Jesus. We hear through his son. Okay, now keep that in your mind and then go to where Abraham has talked about. You jump to chapter 11 in Hebrews and it gives this long list of all of these people who did incredible things. And it goes over and over, says by faith, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Enoch, by faith. You know, so it goes on and on. But the summary of it, okay, the very end of it, it says that these all. Okay, so it lists all of these great people in their deeds. It says these all died having not received the promise, okay? But you and I, okay, if they could do it, okay, it should encourage us. If they could do it without the promise, Abraham died not actually seeing the promise fulfilled. They did it without Jesus Christ. And now we all are filled with his spirit and he has completely washed away our sins. If you are alone, 
in any kind of ministry, if you are, are feeling that call of God and you're like, whoa, God, this is too much for me. I'm all by myself. Well, the thing is, is you have that, that voice, you have that, that crying out, that crodzo, that becomes a regular confirmation to you that you are not alone and you actually have more than what anybody you read of in the Bible. You have more than what any of those Old Testament characters had. They all died anticipating and wanting what you all have. They all wanted what we experience and what we can experience every single day in our prayer rooms. So that's what I would say is, is don't, don't miss the chance to encourage yourself. You feel alone, stir up, as Paul says, stir up the gift that's inside of you is, is you have it. You have everything that you need. You're equipped for that. Uh, there's a, a question here uh, in the chat. Uh, how would you normally explain uh, to a non-apostolic, non-Pentecostal person in your way that if, if you have not spoken in tongues, they have not received the Holy Spirit? It's a very good question. Uh, and the, the biggest way is through uh, the book of Acts. Okay, so two things that are, are unique to, to us as oneness Pentecostals is that uh, when we talk about baptism and we talk about uh, the Holy Spirit, we are our restorationists. So what that means is we want to go back to, we want to restore the church to what it was in the first century. So we only want to do what we find in scripture. Okay? And so when you're looking at scripture, this is not just unique to us. But scholars, people, uh, uh, and so it gets a little weird. Uh, Catholics, uh, a Catholic scholar will actually make the same argument we will make. The difference is they believe that the historical church has authority for establishing doctrine. Okay, so you see that disconnect? Is when the church, the Catholic church says that you don't need to be, you don't need to speak in tongues then Catholics believe that's authoritative, that that has just as much authority as the Bible. And for us, we reject all of that. We say that the only authority in our life is scripture. We establish everything that we do based on scripture. And so actually, a lot of scholars agree with us. And the two things they agree on, okay, is that one, nobody in the New Testament church, nobody that you will find in the New Testament that was called a Christian was unbaptized. Every Christian in the New Testament was baptized in the name of Jesus. Okay? There is no other example within the entire New Testament. Every Christian was baptized in the name of Jesus. Second is that every Christian in the New Testament received the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. There is no other uh, option. And so if you're just looking at the New Testament, that is, is something that is agreed upon even by non-Pentecostal scholars, is that everybody in the New Testament, they all had those two experiences. And so that's where I gave you an example even tonight uh, with Galatians, that you can go through the book of Acts, and you can see that every time in the book of Acts when they, filled with the, they were filled with the Spirit, they, had this, uh, they were accompanied by speaking in an unknown language, speaking in tongues. It actually became their confirmation for how they knew Gentiles had received the spirit because they spoke in tongues in the same way that the Jews spoke in tongues. And so that became a confirmation, but you don't just have to have acts. So like I showed today, you have in Romans and in Galatians, Paul uses this argument of adoption that they cry out, Abba, Father, and cry out means to speak in an unknown language. And so that would be uh, uh, my, my, my source, my avenue of, of talking with somebody and explaining to somebody that's a non-apostolic is uh, I want to, you know, first step one is I want to live what scripture says. That's my conviction as an apostolic. I want to live what scripture says, nothing else. So if I'm just looking at scripture and I dig into scripture with them, that's always a good option is, is saying, let's go through scripture together. And let's, let's start tallying it up. Let's start take, counting and, and seeing uh, the different experiences and the different things in the New Testament. And you will come to, even with your, your friend, if you're going through a Bible study with them, when you get through the New Testament, 
everybody in the New Testament was baptized in the name of Jesus, and they all received the Holy Ghost speaking in an unknown language. Anybody else have any questions? I see a hand raised. Yes, I have oh. a question. Oh, yes. Blessing, sir. Um, the question is, how? what would you say to somebody they believe that the scripture says that, you know, in the New Testament persons, they received the Holy Ghost and they were baptized in Jesus' name, but they're of the conviction that this was only something that came after salvation. So you are saved just by believing, and that's what saves you, just by believing and repenting. But to be a part of the church or to publicly declare that you accept Jesus, you know, he um you can be baptized in jesus name or receive the holy ghost i'm not sure if i understand what i'm saying yes yes it's a a, a very common question um if you look in uh let me pull it up real fast uh one thing to to know uh is is uh in in the new testament uh, you have two different uh, categories is you have history and then you have letters. Those are our two general categories. And all of the letters that we have in the New Testament are not written to new converts. They're all written to churches that are already established. So you first have to make that note is they're all written to churches that are already established. And so uh, think about if you were talking to, uh, uh, you, you have an experience of the, the Holy Spirit. And, and so you notice I'm using the language of experience. Uh, God gives us, isn't it so cool that God gives us a, a actual external objective experience that we know we're saved. Okay. I, I know that I am saved. It's not by my works. It's not that I've done something. Uh, it was supernatural. But I can look back on it and say that that is as a thing. But now think of if I'm preaching a message, and I've even done it a few times here tonight, is I may not always say, you know, every time that I say something about being filled with the Spirit, I may not always say, filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues. I may not always say that, and that's because I know that you've had an experience. Uh, and so I can say uh, to uh, maybe a church congregation, if I'm preaching at my home church, and I, I start trying to get people to testify or, or I'm wanting them to just remember their testimony. I say, do you remember when you cried out to the Lord? Do you remember when you called on the name of the Lord and you were saved? Now, if I say that to all of you, we've had the same experience. I don't need to spell it out. That calling on the name of the Lord is more than just saying, Jesus, you know, we have an experience of, of that whole picture, everything that happened. That is what's going on is you have uh, the Gospels and Acts. Those are history within the New Testament. And then you have all of the letters that are written to churches that are already established. And so when you're looking in uh, the history, the history of the New Testament spells it out. The history of the New Testament says every time they called on the name of the Lord. Hey, that actually is, is a connect. There's a scholar by the name of Lars Hartman and uh, a scholar uh, in our in, in the UPCI is David Norris, who makes the same argument that when they called on the name of the Lord, uh, that was uh, when they're calling down the name of Jesus. It's what's called invocation language and the spirit dwelt with them. And so that's why you see this combination of of baptism and, and Holy Ghost. But in the history books it's spelled out. In the letters to the churches, it doesn't need to be spelled out because he's talking to people that have already experienced what he's discussing. Most of Paul's letters are dealing with more, uh, more church, uh, church problems, church issues, or, or trying to direct us uh, and help us in, in practical areas. He's assuming that we already have that experience. And so anytime that he talks about the, uh, the spirit 
uh, somebody being saved, somebody being saved uh, by calling on the Lord or, or confessing uh, the Lord, that is a, an assumption. It's, it's the, uh, the same way that I would talk to my local church. And let me pull up uh, a verse real fast. Uh, I'm going to have to read through it. This is what I get for, for uh, answering on the fly. Um, and while I'm looking this up, feel free to type any other questions or things like that. I can get to them in a little bit. Um, where is that verse? Okay, First Corinthians six, uh, verse eleven. This is kind of like a full summary statement, but you look at First Corinthians uh, six, verse eleven says, "And such were some of you." And then he gives this list. He says, but you were washed and you were sanctified and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 6, 11. The reason I give this uh, verse to you as an answer is because he gives a full list of what we would consider salvation is washed. Think of baptism. You were sanctified. That's the spirit. And then you were justified. Okay, so... That is what a lot of scholars have problems with is the way that Paul gives that presentation is what a lot of Christianity says today is that if you confess Jesus Christ or you call on Jesus Christ, that that is your, your salvation. And when they say that somebody is saved, what they're saying is that is when you are justified. That is when you are made right with God. What Paul argues here in Corinthians is actually that you're not justified, uh, uh, by a confession of your faith, but you're actually justified because of the washing and the sanctification that takes place. So you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God, that those things took place uh, all, all as one picture. So it's not, uh, it's not that somebody's justified because they call on the Lord, they, that it's just a confession of their mouth but it is also requiring those other steps, those actions. So I hope, I hope that answers the question. Sorry, it took some time to, to find that verse. Yes, it did, thank you. Thank you, sir. I have time for, I think, one more question. Uh, so if anybody has one. There's another question. Okay, there's another hand. Okay. There's another hand. I'm or they're just trying to scroll through all of the names. There's a lot of y'all on this call. Praise God. But I'm trying to scroll through the names to see uh where the raised hand is. But you can start whoever raised their hand, you can ask a question. I'll find you. Is it uh Abigail? Okay, thank you. Praise okay. the Lord, sir. I was waiting for somebody to unmute me. I wasn't able to. All right, so the question is, all right, so today I was on this prayer line, this prayer marathon, right? I invited one of my high school friends, and she came on the ending, and I texted her and said, oh, I saw that you were on, and she was saying that, yes, she could feel it. It was powerful, and I know for a fact that she did receive the Holy Ghost, 
but she's not baptized in Jesus name. I actually witnessed to her and she went ahead and got baptized in the name of the Father's and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so you know how I felt. So I was explaining to her afterward, even before that, I was telling her about Jesus name baptism and the importance, but she does not see the importance. So now that we're finished with high school and we're in college, well, she graduated the other day, but I want to know if, I don't know how to bring it up back yet. <laughs> I, is, I'm wondering if my timing is off. I just don't know how to bring it up. Could you, what advice could you give me on how to bring it up? Or even when you're witnessing to somebody and you don't want to seem as if you're pushing it down your throat or every day you talk to them, you're bringing it up to them. I want to know, you know, when... <laughs> or how can you bring it forward to them again? Yeah. This is getting a little bit into what I'll talk with you next time about of, of Bible studies. But my quick answer is that uh, I always, whenever I'm, I'm working with somebody, I want to have them see it in scripture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I want to, in any conversation, I want somebody to be put in a position where they're wrestling with God, not me. So that if they're going to say, no, I'm not going to get baptized in Jesus name. That means that they're saying no to the word of God, not no to me. Now, I, that's just a, a quick illustration. You don't want to say that to them up front it might be, uh, it could be offensive. Is, is it, do you want to say no to God? You know? uh, yeah. But uh, when you talk with somebody, the nice thing is that because of who we are, because of how we we give our doctrine and we teach our doctrine, uh, we actually more than any other Christian group, we don't have to be scared of scripture. OK, we don't ever have to be scared of scripture. We can walk through the text. We can walk through the biblical text and can always count on it showing the truth. And so I don't have to uh, worry about somebody going through the Bible on their own. And so usually what I want to do is that I want to invite them into Bible studies. And so this is what I would say is for your friend is you don't have to push, uh, but pray for God to be supernaturally working on their heart is, is tell the Lord I'm ready. Say, God, I'm ready to have the conversations with them. So you, you be working on their heart stirring stirring their heart um but then the other part is whenever you start having those conversations start talking to them about the bible and say let's let's do some bible studies and go through the bible because uh something that uh people cannot actually uh i i have a, a friend right now that i'm discipling and he uh we've just been going through the bible together and he actually texted me the other day and he said you know you guys baptize in jesus name and i understand why he said how come the church so he doesn't know he doesn't know much but he says how come other churches baptize in the father the son and the holy spirit when it's only mentioned one time in all of scripture so he's coming to that conclusion on his own so i don't have to 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 uh, tell him that it's a doctrine. I don't have to, to, to push it on him at all, but he's able to read. If he just reads through the new Testament, he's going to see Jesus, 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 Jesus everywhere in the new Testament. He's only going to see the father, son, and the Holy spirit one time. Now, anybody who's just reading and they're reading, honestly, they're just going through, you're looking at it and you say, there's, there's one anomaly. We've got to figure this out. What does it mean? because it's different from everything else that's in the New Testament. And so when you have them walking through that and they're coming through the conclusions on their own, then it makes it to where you become a guide rather than you, you needing to try to, to push them a little bit further, push them a little bit further. And we trust that the Lord is going to be leading in his spirit. He can stir up those things in people's hearts where they're being sensitive to the word as they're reading through. But I would, I would pray. Uh, be diligent, be, be ready, ask the Lord for wisdom when the opportunity comes, but pray. And a lot of times what I love about praying for people is that it makes me more aware just because I'm praying for them. 
is I'm going to, I'm going to be waiting for every opportunity. I'm going to be ready when I see them. I'm going to be ready when they call me, message me, anything. And I'll even have a, the right heart if I feel the Lord leading me to call them or message them in some way to do those things. So I'd encourage you to just uh, focus on prayer and then just be ready to have conversations about the Bible when the door opens up and the, and the Bible will speak for itself. Uh, Brother Colin, yes. uh, um, I know that um, there were two, you said that was the last, but there were two more questions were in the chat. I'm not sure if you want to um, still take those ones as well. Uh, let um, me look. There's one by Felicia um, that said, if the Holy Ghost reveals something to you, a word, something he wants to say that you've heard no one else say, God is sharing his heart. Should you share it if led in spite of what critics may say? Should you be silent? Least person say God didn't tell the elders, so it's not God speaking through you. Uh, I would say you need to uh, ask the Lord for discernment. So there's some things that the Lord will, will uh, share with us that we can uh, share with others. And then there's sometimes the Lord will share things with us that are for our edification to serve others. I might not say what the Lord has told me. So if the Lord shares his heart with me, I may not need to share that with other people, but that is a, a, a message from the Lord to me so that I can go minister to those people. And so the way that you know that difference is you want the Lord. It's a, it's a gift of the spirit. You say, Lord, I, I am trying to figure this out. Please give me discernment right now to know what to do with this word that you've given me. I'm not doubting that it's a word from you, but I need now the wisdom to know what, what should I do with this word? And so that's what I try to encourage even students at Urshan College is don't ever get into a position where you fear yourself or you doubt yourself. Just make the next step in submission to God is the reason I hear from God in the first place is because I'm submitted. And then because I'm submitted, the next step I'll take is say, okay, God, I feel like you've given me this word. What do I do with it? Do I go tell the elders? Do I go tell uh, the, the people? Do I go tell one individual? And every single step is in submission, but don't fear the Lord in, in that sense. Obviously, we fear the Lord in, in, in worship, that kind of thing. But don't fear. Don't be afraid that God can, can speak to you and do things through you and sometimes say things uh, uh, that are for encouragement. The number one guide is to know as much Bible as you can, because uh, the messages that we sometimes receive from the Lord go hand in hand with scripture. And so that can be a, a huge confidence, a huge confirmation for you when you're trying to figure out those times is the more scripture that you have in your heart, you're able to say, oh, yes, this is in line with the word of God. I know this is from him. And so I'm going to act on it. And then the, the next question is uh, for persons who are of the belief that we are not Jesus' disciples, but the 12 that were appointed and called are. So the Great Commission is not given to us, but to them. How do you reach those believers? Uh, I think, again, a, a, a key answer to this is, is to, to work through the process of Scripture is uh, the um, more than the 12 within Scripture we're called disciples. Uh, and so uh, when, when you look through, and, and so first, when, when you are a disciple, that means that you are being replicated. So uh, when Peter is walking with Jesus, he's becoming, he's trying to be like Jesus. And so even Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Okay. And so that is what discipleship is, is an imitation. And so when Jesus says to the 12 to go make disciples, okay, so he's saying to them, he says, go make disciples. Uh, in uh, the King James Version, I believe it says go teach. Uh, but in other translations, the language there in Matthew chapter 28 is actually go make disciples. It's not teach in the sense of, of lecture people, but he says go make disciples. And so now work, work through this is, if he is telling his disciples to make disciples and they're supposed to imitate him, what are they going to do? They're going to tell their disciples to make disciples. 
as it continues to, to roll over and over is if I am going to be an actual disciple, just like Jesus, that means I have to tell my disciple to go make a disciple and they have to tell their disciple to go make a disciple. And we actually see this play out uh, even in Acts that we have others that are called disciples through the book of Acts. Uh, and it, it's not until, oh, I don't want to say it wrong. I, I think it might be chapter, it's either 10 or 12 uh, in, in, in Acts that it says that they're called Christians. Uh, it says that the, the uh, disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Um, and so that's when they first, when the, when the group actually first gets called Christians, but until that time they were all referred to. So you think about like the 120, you think about the 3000 that were added, uh, to the church in, in chapter two, uh, all of these, they were all referred to as disciples. They weren't called Christians, uh, until later on in the book of Acts. And it's because they were discipling. They were, they were imitating Jesus. And by that they were teaching others to imitate Jesus, which would require making disciples. So that would be my, my response to them is let's look through scripture. Let's, let's uh, get this uh, in order in scripture and then ask them, say, okay, so do you think I'm a disciple? You know, what, do, you, do you want to be a disciple of, of Christ? That would be different from a category of like the, the uh, 12 apostles. So if, if we refer to like the 12 disciples as the 12 apostles, that would be uh, different. And that, that goes into uh, the, the authority of scripture. And so uh, we do, uh, we should have apostles today uh, because Paul says in scripture that he gave some apostles, some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry. Uh, and so we should have apostles today. But when we refer to the 12 apostles or, or the authority of the apostles, that's a reference to the authority of scripture to give us doctrine. So that would be different from the role of what a, an apostle would be. So I hope that answers your question. But I need to uh, go. Uh, I've got a, a few things I got to take care of. I got to put together a few baby things for my wife. So it's been wonderful being with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mother Chris, by the way. It was really good um, having you here. And we're really excited about going forward. Um, this is the beginning of great things to come. And we believe this will cause us to be more active as the church, you know, fulfilling God's mission for the church and not just the, the mission of the church. And so um, we're excited about what's to come and going forward as a campus ministry. And for even those that are here that are not from the campus ministry, but really want to walk uh, in as a life, as a disciple, as a Christian. So God bless you. And I'm going to ask Sister Daniel to lead us as we are going to close in prayer. We appreciate you, sir, Krishna. Thank you, Lord. I apologize for my camera being off. My internet is a bit weak, but let's all pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we glorify your name. We thank you tonight, Lord Jesus, for the words that have been spoken. We thank you for your word, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have spoken through your servant. We thank you, mighty God, for every single thing that was done, all that happened, Lord Jesus Christ, in the spirit, Lord Jesus, while we listened, while he spoke, mighty God of Daniel, the prophecy, your promises, Lord Jesus, we believe. And before we do anything else, God, we give you thanks in advance, Lord Jesus, for what you will do. We give you thanks in advance. Lord Jesus Christ, for the prophecy, Lord God Almighty, we give you thanks in advance for all that which will come to pass. Because if you said it, Lord Jesus Christ, we believe it and we know that it will happen. And so we rejoice, Lord Jesus Christ, by faith, we rejoice and we tell you thanks for the revival that is to come. We tell you thanks, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be using us as evangelists. You will be using us, Lord Jesus Christ, to go forward to the uttermost 
parts of this earth, Lord Jesus, and to preach this gospel, to preach this truth, Lord Jesus, that this undiluted truth, this uncompromised truth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, guys, for the souls that will be impacted through this Bible study, for persons, Lord Jesus, guys, that we will go forward to, Lord God, and evangelize the per persons that we will witness to, persons that we will disciple, Lord Jesus, guys, because of the teachings and the happenings, Lord God Almighty, of these Bible studies. We give you thanks in advance, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that this time for our hearts, and I pray, Holy Father, that you will help our hearts, Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to hide these words in our hearts, that we will go forward applying what we have heard, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, to our lives, remembering that we are children of the living God. We are children of the free woman. Lord Jesus Christ, we have the spirit living inside of us. And as we go forward to evangelize, it's not in our talents. It's not in the, the big words that we use. It's it's not even just in the presentation. It's not in our talents and skills, Lord, but it is by your spirit. And that, in no, that alone, Lord Jesus Christ, is enough. We're not doing it, Lord God Almighty, of our own works. And we give you thanks for that. It brings so much hope and peace and joy in acknowledging and knowing that it is by your spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, that we will evangelize. It is by your spirit, Lord Jesus Christ, that we will go forth. And so I pray against all fear, Lord Jesus and I pray that we will just have that confidence and peace knowing that once we have spoken in tongues as the spirit gives the utterance once we have received the gift of the Holy Ghost we are called and we can go forth preaching and teaching making disciples Lord Jesus Christ in this world I pray that you will encourage every single one of our hearts Lord Jesus Christ even if you know we feel as if we don't have all of the eloquent speech we don't have all of the talents to speak and all of that I pray that we will rejoice just in the fact that we have the Holy Ghost, just in the fact that we are children of the living God, just in the fact that we are children of the free woman, we are the seed of Abraham, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you have called us and sent us, Lord Jesus, to go forth preaching, making disciples, Lord God Almighty, for your kingdom. I bless your name, Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you will be with us even as we leave, even as we go, and that we will continue meditating on your words, studying the word for ourselves, Lord Jesus, equipping ourselves, mighty God of Daniel and the spirit, Lord Jesus, as we go. We glorify your name. We give you thanks, Lord Jesus Christ. We exalt your name, Lord. We thank you, God Almighty. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, God bless you again, everyone. And uh, as you know, we'll be continuing next Saturday at 6.30 p.m. We'll be doing this series for the rest of the semester. And it's our hope. We know the times are changing as a matter, but it's our hope that in our next semester, these teachings would have empowered us to actually go into different areas as a ministry. So stay tuned to what the Lord will cause us to do next as we continue to learn how to be a disciple and to make others as disciples as well. God bless you tonight. And we will see each other next week with another person, with another friend who you invite to this same platform. God bless you all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Wherever you're listening, wherever you are, why don't you lift your hands and just begin to worship the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, the name that's able to save. Everybody clap those hands like this. Come on, say it.